Hello, my dear friends. It is great to talk to you from the Torch Center in Houston, Texas. And in this special edition of the podcast, I am going to be trying something very different. And before you send me any angry emails, I want to explain the concept of what I'm trying to do in this episode and in the ones that will follow in this series. I know that many of you have very strong feelings about COVID and the vaccines and the COVID vaccines and the mandate, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And as I always say, I know nothing about politics or medicine or anything like that. But this podcast is not about COVID, but about a different epidemic, maybe even a pandemic. And one that to a certain extent is equally deadly, certainly on an emotional or spiritual or familial level. But unlike COVID, most people don't think of it as an epidemic. And certainly most people don't think of it as one that has a vaccine, one that has proven cures and prophylactics. Most people assume that it just is what it is and there's nothing to do about it. So I wanted today in this episode to frame the discussion of marriage and divorce and, of course, marital discord and marital and relationship erosion in general, I want to frame it as a pandemic or an epidemic that has a vaccine that can solve the problem. And this is the first dose. Now, the reason why I'm comparing it to an epidemic with a vaccine is that it has, I think, like an epidemic, a certain element of virality to it. This is something, divorce is something that has become so common and acceptable. It's almost like it's expected, it's anticipated to a certain degree. You hear people like that. They say, well, you know, we're getting married, but I'm not sure how long it's going to last. We've all heard that. And certainly it's not something which is as taboo as it used to be. Make sure you get that prenup. Make sure you have an escape plan. You know, things happen. You got to be prepared. Now, of course, we're obviously generalizing here. This is not about everyone. And whenever we talk about broad society-wide problems, I have to remind everyone and we have to remind ourselves that we're not addressing, of course, a specific individual, but we're talking about the subject in general, how it is played out in our society. And no one can deny that modern society is just really, really bad at this whole marriage divorce thing. You know, if the failure rates of divorce, of marriage, marriages that end up in divorce, if that existed in any other field or industry, no one would tolerate it. You know, 50% of your cars broke down in the first year or 50% of houses, maybe this is a better example, 50% of houses or buildings collapsed we would say, what's going on with the architecture? We try to address the problem. In this podcast series, I am positing that marriage and divorce in our society is broken. It's a pandemic. And this is the first dose of the vaccine. Please, God, we will do a second dose. We want to make sure that everyone is fully vaccinated. And maybe even a third dose, a booster shot, we shall yet see. So let's get back to the framework of what we're going to try to do here. The rates of divorce are pretty high in recent decades. I've heard that they've gone down a little bit in recent years. Maybe that's because there's just fewer marriages. But certainly, if you compare it to the way things were, let's say, 100 years ago or 200 years ago, they're very high. And that, I believe, is not because matches are worse per se or that the institution of marriage, of matrimony, is just not a modern concept, but because there's an epidemic. Divorce has become more common society-wide, and it's viral, and it affects everyone. And what we want to do with this podcast is to talk about the vaccine. And like a vaccine, I'm going to have to jab something in your arm. There's going to be some pain in this prescription. What we're going to offer is something that is going to be a little bit painful like a vaccine, like a shot. But the hope is that it will shield you to avoid much more pain down the line. And we believe that divorce is a terrible thing. Of course, people who have gone through this themselves know how painful it is. If your parents, for example, got divorced, you know how traumatic that is. 
The Talmud says that it's the most devastating thing. In the words of the Talmud, even the altar in the temple sheds tears when a couple gets the worst. You think about it, you know, people committed themselves to each other. Till death do us part. And then they get broken up and the relationship goes south and people are torn apart. People are torn asunder by their relationship being destroyed. It's a terrible thing. And the vaccine is also a little bit painful, as you shall see. But hopefully it's going to prevent the much greater pain down the line. Now, like the vaccine, we're not offering a solution that's 100% effective. We're aiming for 95% efficacy against all variants. I'm acknowledging there will be some breakthrough cases that get by the vaccine. We're not talking about 100% efficacy. Think of it as 95.465 in the latest trials. Another way to explain what we're trying to do, the concept, the framework. Moreover, if you have comorbidities, the vaccine will be less effective. In this context, comorbidities means you have bad character and you have elements about your personality that make you a more difficult person to settle down and to have a harmonious and happy and stable and enriching relationship with another person. Now, also, like the vaccine, you know, if someone, God forbid, has COVID and they're intubated, God forbid, in the hospital, and they're very sick, you need something else other than a vaccine. A vaccine is there to prevent the problems before they even arise. Once the problem is present, God forbid, then you need something more like a therapeutic, something more direct. It's too late to stop it with a vaccine. And similarly here, what we're going to discuss is a vaccine. If someone is already in a marriage that's falling apart, God forbid, they need a more direct intervention. It's too late, at least for certain elements of the vaccine. It may help, but we're definitely not promising the 95.7987% efficacy. Now, the first dose that we're going to cover in this episode is about choosing the right spouse. If you're going to get married, it means that there's one person in the world that's going to be your partner for the rest of your life. According to our tradition, it's not just the rest of your life when you're alive, body and soul bound together. It's your partner forever and ever and ever, even in heaven, even in the afterlife, even in paradise, forever. You two are like two halves of one whole. And therefore, it's imperative to make sure that you make the right choices. Who are you going to settle down with? Who are you going to commit to? And we're going to try to offer in the first dose the approach and the various instructions needed to make sure that you select the right spouse for you, you find the right mate, you marry the right one. And we're going to orient our discussion on this week's Parsha. So I'm actually recording this on Friday and we're about to go into Shabbos of Parsha's Chayi Sara. I'm not going to release this on Friday. I just generally don't like releasing new episodes on Friday. We'll release it either on Sunday or Monday. But in our Parsha, chapter 24 of Genesis, there is a very lengthy narrative about courtship and, and choosing a spouse. And of course, we know there are no needless stories in the Torah. They all have lessons. We're told that in general, the book of Genesis is supposed to be instructive for us. The stories of the forefathers are there to provide guidance for us. And we have the story, a whole chapter in the Torah dedicated to finding a spouse. Chapter 24 of Genesis. This chapter is the Torah's definitive guidelines for spousal selection. And what I want to do is to go through it and to break it down piece by piece to draw from it the important principles of how to go about this subject and what we learn, the lessons that we take away, that is going to comprise the first dose of our vaccine. This story is the prototype of how to find the right spouse. So let's begin. So chapter 24 is talking about, you know, Sarah has passed already. Chapter 23, Sarah passes, she's buried. Chapter 24, Abraham is looking for a wife for his son, Isaac. 
Isaac is already, you know, mature and ready to get married. And he is very particular about the kind of girl he's looking for. She has to be from his family. The problem is his family doesn't live in their neighborhood. They live in back in Haran in Aram Naharayim. So he sends his messenger, Eliezer, his right-hand man, go travel back to my homeland and go to my family and find a relative of mine that's a suitable candidate to marry Isaac. And Eliezer, Abraham's right man, travels with the whole entourage, with the whole coterie, with his retinue. And they arrive there and they meet Rebecca. He meets Rebecca at the well. And then he says, or actually before he meets Rebecca, he says to God, he makes a prayer. And he says, well, I'm, I'm here and I'm, I'm looking for a spouse, for Isaac. But there's lots of girls here. How do I know where to start? Help me. He makes a pitch for divine aid. And he says, let me make a test. I'm going to ask the girl, the prospective candidate. I'm going to ask her, provide me some water. Oh, I'm so thirsty. Could you give me some water? And I'm not going to tell her anything else that I want. And the girl that's the right one, the one that's destined to marry Isaac, the one that's destined to join this empire of kindness of Abraham, the one that's going to be one of the matriarchs of the Jewish people, at this founding stage, at the nascent stage of the Jewish people, she is going to know that I also need water for my camels. And without being told, she is going to fill up water for the camels. That's his pitch. That's what he asks God for. And right when he finishes the prayer, Rebecca comes out, she struts out, and she has her pail on her shoulder, and she's gorgeous, and she goes to fill up water, and Eliezer runs over to her and says, can I have some water? And she gives him water, and then she fills up for all the camels. Amazing. And he's like, what's your name? Well, my name's Rebecca, and I come from this and this family. Oh, and come stay by our house. He's like, I can't believe it. This is a relative of... Abraham, this is actually Isaac's first cousin once removed. This is amazing. And he goes, negotiates with her family. They agree to send Rebecca back west with Eliezer to marry Isaac. And uh, the next morning they have some cold feet. But ultimately, Rebecca travels back with Eliezer. And she marries Isaac. And they're happy. And they're in love. And that is the end of the story, the end of chapter 24 in Genesis. So if we study the story, we find, at least at the very beginning, something very interesting. You know, this is the quest to find a spouse for Isaac. And who goes to look for a spouse? Not Isaac. Not even Isaac's father, Abraham. Abraham's servant and confidant, Eliezer. The first thing we find that's really interesting is that the prototype of a story of seeking a spouse is done via an emissary. It's done via a third party. The principals are not involved. It's Eliezer, Abraham's servant, and he's actually dealing not even with Rebecca. He's dealing with Rebecca's family. Isaac doesn't go. Why would you offload this most important decision to an emissary? Why is the agent involved? Why doesn't Isaac himself go? So the first lesson we see, very important, very interesting, is that it's very helpful to have an impartial go-between to mediate between the parties for a few reasons. First of all, if a person themselves makes a decision, who do I want to meet? Who do I want to get to know? Who do I want to potentially develop a relationship with? Who do I want to marry? There is a risk of infatuation of delusion. There are blind spots that we all have. And we've all been there when a friend of mine or a friend of ours, a friend of yours, is getting into a really dangerous relationship with someone and they're ruining his life and we can't stop it. And we say to them, try to bang some sense into them and say, don't you realize what you're doing to yourself? This is a terrible person that's taking advantage of you. What are you thinking? What are you doing? And that's the problem. This is the first problem that we meet is that, you know, we're looking for something, but we also have, you know, hormones and desires and lust, and we could get deluded and we could get infatuated. 
It's very dangerous. In fact, the commentaries on this particular piece of the Torah, they say that it's quite common The people try to find the most attractive mate. Oh, they're really gorgeous. They're really handsome. Oh, they have a lot of money. They have means. Look at the car they drive. Oh, they come from a very special family. They have power. They have status. All these things can potentially lead a person astray. All these things are not really as important as a person's character and what they want in life and what they value in life and what are their priorities and what do they want in a spouse? What matters is character and values. That's what's really important. And we see over here something really interesting. Sometimes when you use the services of a go-between, it's actually more beneficial because if they introduce you to someone they know both parties or they get to know both parties and they are not you know, part of this equation – They don't have any skin in the game. They're not the ones whose hormones are raging. They could be an effective judge of character, values, and priorities. They could test whether there is suitability here, whether there is compatibility here. And therefore, we see that just the very beginning, Abraham is using an intermediate. And if you think about it, you know, what's the classic way that people meet? Boy meets girl. They get to know each other. They fall in love. They spend some time together. Oh, let's settle down. Let's have kids. Let's get married. If you think about it, this is just a a really poorly constructed system. It's almost like totally illogical. You know, there's no other decision of this magnitude that you would do with such a poor system. Which college to go to? I don't know. Let me go to the bar and see which colleges strike my fancy. Which major should I do? What job? What place should I live? In all of these other important questions that we have in our life, we try to approach it logically. We try to do our due diligence. We try to research. We speak to guidance counselors. Who are we going to work for? Who are we going to hire as an employee? Well, let's do some rigorous interview process. Top grading system. Let's find if there's a fit. Let's find if there's compatibility. What should we invest in? What stocks, investment, retirement accounts? Should it be a Roth IRA or a traditional IRA? Which for our sizable international audience, these are various investment accounts that are part of the American system. Should we have a 401k? Should we do matching? How exactly should we file our taxes? These are questions we talk to professionals about. It's a real estate deal. What do we do? Do we just sign the dotted line? Or do we walk the neighborhood, run the numbers, project the deal forward, start a business? How do you start a business? Do your research. You write a business plan. You speak to mentors. But somehow, when it comes to the most important decision of your life, the decision that will affect you more than any other decision, the decision that will be the number one determinant of how happy you are in your life, of how healthy you are in your life, of what your children will be like, it's almost done at least in the classical sense, on an ad hoc basis. It's illogical. If you think about it, it's a little bit, uh, frankly, preposterous. Is it a shock that marriages that are poorly constructed often collapse? It doesn't make sense. It doesn't have to be like that. There is a logical, rigorous stable, sane way to seek a spouse. Not just roll the dice, hoping for some chance, serendipity, not throwing darts at the wall and see what sticks. A logical way to do it. Now, I want to point out, just in truth, I feel like the world in general is coming around to this. You know, a lot of dating today happens, or at least is facilitated via apps and algorithms. It seems like this idea of having a matchmaker, having a go-between is actually gaining steam in the world at large. But the first thing we learn here, the first element of our concoction in our vaccine is the importance of a matchmaker, of a go-between to help ensure that people find a suitable candidate. Another point here, there's no dating as an antidote to loneliness. Eliezer here is inspecting the girl 
does she have what it what's needed to be a match with Isaac? In society at large, people date just to date, to have a relationship, but not necessarily to think about, is this a person I want to spend the rest of my life with? And I'll tell you something again, we're acknowledging this is a vaccine. I'm about to jab you with a little pain in your arm. Every other person that you are with diminishes the ability for you to settle down permanently with your spouse. The Talmud tells us, this is one of those Talmuds that when you hear it, you don't forget it. The Talmud tells us that if there's a second marriage, so he was married once to someone else, she was married once to someone else, and now they're having a second marriage, it's an attempt to try it again. Again, just to clarify, each one of them were married to different people. The Talmud says that on their wedding night, when they finally go into bed together, there are actually four people in that bed. That's what the Talmud says. Meaning that all the people that you're with, all the people that you have a serious relationship with, all that is part of your permanent baggage that you take with you. And again, we're very careful here not to judge anyone, not to say, oh, you made mistakes. Oh, you dated these terrible people or not even terrible people. You, you made poor relationship choices. You're doomed forever. Of course not. But again, as a principle, if we have the ability to decide what's the best way forward, again, we're trying to be as realistic as possible. What are the conditions to get that 95.87432% efficacy? We learn that the dating process is there to determine whether or not there's suitability and not just to have a relationship because that is going to imperil or make it at least much more difficult to find harmony and peace with your spouse. Every relationship that you maintain becomes a permanent part of you. And therefore, the best way to do this, the vaccine's way of doing this, is to decide, to find out, to determine who it is that you want to spend the rest of your life with and reserve yourself for them. And again, I apologize if this is painful. Remember, this is a vaccine. It's painful. That's what you signed up for. Now, Abraham, he gives a very important instruction to Eliezer before he goes east to find a spouse for Isaac. He tells him, and he makes him swear, not to take a Canaanite woman for Isaac. He says, go to my land, go to my homeland, and find me someone for my family, but under no circumstances may you take a Canaanite woman for Isaac. Now, I think this rings to us as, you know, controversial to modern sensibilities. What about uh, diversity? What about uh, multiculturalism? Why is he being so particular? It's got to be for my family, for my hometown, for my people, for my family, the, the, the relatives of mine. So we see another point over here. Pedigree and background is very important for the purposes of compatibility. Our question over here is simple. We're looking for a spouse that's the best candidate to have a very good relationship with. A relationship that becomes immune, 95%, to divorce. It's really good. It's a happy, harmonious, stable relationship. And we want to know, is this person a good fit, a good candidate, or not? And here we see that family and background matter. And indeed, the studies have shown the more differences there are in the spouse's background, the more hurdles needed to overcome and the more likely it is that the marriage will fall apart. The more differences, those differences are going to augment and lengthen and make more difficult the acclimation process needed to take two different people from two different backgrounds, entirely different ways of interfacing with the world, to have them meld into one, to have them become one flesh. That's very difficult to begin with. The more differences that they have in their background, in how they see the world, all that is going to exacerbate the acclimation process. And therefore, if the objective is to have a union that lasts, a union that endures, a union that will not suffer 
the terrible fate of divorce, the best thing to do, the logical thing to do is to try to minimize the differences between the spouses. So if one of them, for example, is a Jew and the other one is a non-Jew, there's now a religious divide between these two. What's going to happen when one spouse wants a menorah and the other one wants a tree? What's going to be when one prefers this religion and one that? You are inviting marital distort and fragmentation. What about cultural differences? One is an American and one comes from France. Okay? I know we're allies, but still, they're different. One comes to the United States and one comes from, I don't know, Pakistan or Russia or whatever. There are now cultural divides, social divides that are going to make it more difficult for these two people to harmonize into one. People have certain implicit expectations about how things ought to be and you can be inviting friction. What about political differences? People take politics very seriously, I've been told. And of course, I know nothing about politics. But if one is a staunch Republican and one is a staunch Democrat and they take it very seriously and they know about the issues and the candidates and the people and all that, what's it going to be? They're going to be fighting. Is it worth it? Does it make sense to invite people or, or to consider people who are going to be so different and, we've, and have another reason to fight over? Temperamental differences. Again, these are examples of this principle. The more similarities, the better. The more compatibility, the more suitability we have over here. And the general principle I'm trying to convey here is that the things that are important to you, the things that really, really matter, in those areas, you must find compatibility. There's enough friction as it is when two people from different families, different backgrounds, they want to harmonize to a single unit. There's no need to make this harder than it already is. Now, if the differences are, let's say, in immaterial things, how to place the toilet paper? Is the is it facing this way or facing that way? Or, or the big argument about pineapple pizza, squeezing the toothpaste from the bottom up. In those areas, not a problem. But the things that actually matter in life, that we have to make sure that there is compatibility. Compatibility does not have to be present in the small things. Star Wars or Star Trek? No, I've never watched either one of them. But I gather that uh, each one of these has a different crowd. And uh, apparently there's some friction between those two. But does this really matter? Does it matter if one's a Packers fan and one's a Bears fan? You know, actually, I have to say, growing up as a Mets fan, I don't know about the Phillies fans or the Bracer fans. I don't know about that. But in all seriousness, there are things that are not inherent to your actual life. Those things, it doesn't matter if there are incompatibilities. I like to think of relationship compatibility as like a pyramid. The bottom of the pyramid, the base of the pyramid, are the things that actually matter, the character, values, priorities, what kind of life you want to live, what kind of home you want to have, what are the things that really matter to you. And as you get further and further up, the Star Wars or Star Trek, that's the tip, tip of the pyramid. It matters very, very little. You know, was it a blue and black dress or a white and gold dress? Did you hear Yanni or Laurel? or sports, or taste in music, or movies, or art, or literature. Oh, we both love this band. That's a very poor reason to establish a relationship upon. Now, I will point out, you know, podcasts actually matter. If they enjoy the Torch podcasts, you know they're a keeper, they're intelligent, they're sharp, they're witty, they're on the ball. They're probably handsome as well. Of course, we're making a joke here, but there is something to that. If on the intellectual principles, on the emotional principles, the values of the life, the things that actually matter, that actually are the foundation of a person's life, if those things are aligned, it's okay if you have different food choices and, and you know, different entertainment. That's fine as long as the bottom of this compatibility index is aligned. The nonsense should not 
dominate the compatibility evaluations. The fact that you have different interests, that's okay. Maybe that's even better if you have different interests as long as your priorities and your ideals and your values are aligned. The essence of life is who a person is. The values, the character, the ambition, you know, the aspirations, the family, what are you living for, what do you want to accomplish in life, the preferences and entertainment. That's a very small part of the essence of life. And if that is the basis of a relationship, oh, we both love the Longhorns or the Aggies or the Lakers. That's a very weak foundation. That building is liable to collapse. Now, I, I did have a pet theory. You know, why is, why is there such an obsession with Star Wars and Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings, all of these fantasy works of fiction that talk about a different world? So I mentioned Star Wars and Star Trek and all these things. I figured I'd share with you my pet theory. This has nothing to do with the vaccine, so you could skip this. But I figured I'll tell it to you. You could add this if you disagree with that saying you just add it to the angry email about the vaccine. Just add it as a you know a subtitle or a sub a footnote in in your email. And the email address is of course rabbitwitchable.com. So my theory as to why people love these kinds of entertainment is that humans, we have a soul. And the soul comes from a different world. And the soul yearns to leave this world and to go back to a different world. It's almost like we have this innate pining and yearning for a different world. Of course, we believe in Olam Abba, world to come. We're obsessed with it. But society at large that doesn't focus as much on the afterlife, the world to come, they're going to seek a replacement. And that's why there's such popularity in all these parts of entertainment that deal with a different world. Again, this is my total pet theory. I made it up myself. If you don't like it, just add it to the uh, to the mail to the email that uh, about the vaccines. Okay, so we have a few points over here. Let's just recap where we are. We're trying to find the divorce vaccine, and dose number one is about marrying the right person. And we said we have some guidance here in the Torah, and it's telling us to approach these things logically as we would do any major decision. Use the services of an impartial third party who's not deceived by lust, who's not deceived by infatuation. We want to avoid situations that could lead to catastrophe. We want to see things clearly. It's helpful to have a sounding board, someone else who could help us. And then we see about what we're looking for, the values and priorities in the background. That's critical because acclimation is hard enough as is. Don't exacerbate it. Now, back to the narrative in Genesis chapter 24, we see that Abraham, not only does he give instructions to Eliezer to not take a Canaanite woman for Isaac, instead to go to his family, but he makes him swear to that effect. Now, the verse tells us that Abraham trusts Eliezer with everything. He runs all of Abraham's affairs. Abraham trusts him completely with material matters. But with respect to who he is going to choose or he is who he's going to select for Isaac, in that matter, spousal selection is more important than money management. And Abraham's more concerned about it. And he doesn't, he doesn't just trust him. He says, I want you to swear. I'm not playing any games. I'm not taking any chances. This is too critical. So Eliezer takes 10 camels and he has a bunch of people come with him. And they travel to Aram Naharaim, to the city of Nahor, Abraham's brother. Now, it's interesting, Eliezer takes lots of money and assets and jewelry and gold with 10 camels to go find a spouse for Isaac. Why is he traveling laden with so many valuables? So Rashi tells us that he's trying to entice the other side. He wants them to jump at the opportunity. Oh, what a family. Oh, Abraham's so important. He is an influencer. He started a movement and he also is very wealthy. Oh, he has the means. I think this is teaching us that you as a candidate or you as someone who's looking for a spouse, you have to do whatever you can to put your best foot forward. 
to make yourself the best candidate that you can be. And what does that mean? So, of course, it means if you have the ability to support someone, if you have qualities, don't shirk away from them, develop them, present them, make yourself an attractive candidate. But in general, the more a person develops themselves and their character and works on becoming a a better person, the more attractive a marriage candidate they are. Beforehand, ahead of time, you work hard to become a better person, to improve yourself, and then they're going to jump at you. So, of course, this means a lot of things in all kinds of different areas. Now, one area that I want to talk about, very important, the things that you do, the decisions that you make, the sins that you do with other people before you get married, the things that you look at, all that comes with you. All that complicates your union or your capacity to have an enduring union. The heroes of our people are the ones who develop self-control, who fight their Yitzhara before they get married. Think about it. You know, when you're a teenager, you're an adolescent, you're a young man, a young woman, your body is causing all kinds of problems for you. We are wired to look for a spouse even before we're ready. And again, we have, like we mentioned earlier, all these hormones that are driving us crazy. And the more control a person has and the more a person resists the temptations, they are going to benefit from it tremendously. And I'm going to tell you two secrets. Two secrets. You ready for two secrets? Here's two secrets. Number one, the holiness of the parents is going to be transmitted to their children. The more the parents resisted their Yetzirah before their marriage, and frankly, even when you are married, there are all kinds of temptations. The Yetzirah is a wily, clever little devil and works overtime trying to get people, especially the talented people amongst us, to do foolish things that they will regret every day of their lives. But the more the parents fight it, the higher the level of soul they will get for their children. You want to have special children? You want to have talented children? You want to have pure children? One of the ways to do it, this is a secret, but it's true, proven, documented, and also found in the more exotic sources. One of the ways to do that is to ensure before you get married that you maintain your holiness and fidelity. That's secret number one. Secret number two, and this is maybe more applicable to men than women, but I guess it would apply to both. The more you overcome your temptations and the more kinds of temptations that you forego when it is forbidden for you, all those things that you forego or forwent, how do you say that? Foregoed or forwent, all those things the Almighty will give it to you in a permissible way. So therefore, when it comes to playing the field, the more sins that you have before marriage, the less fulfilling your marriage will be. And again, what we're talking about over here is painful. It's a vaccine. But it works. And again, I want to reiterate, every person that you're with before you get married is part of your baggage forever. Remember those four people in the bedroom. We have to try to be very careful not to do things that will compromise our marriage even before it gets started. Everything that you've seen, it all comes with you. Of course, we believe in repentance. And one of the signs of complete repentance, our sages tell us, is when you forget the sin that you did. Sins are fixable. But let's establish this point. Don't think that you can act with impunity before you settle down and not have it negatively affect you once you try to dedicate your life to one person. And again, we're acknowledging this sounds harsh. We're trying to be as realistic as possible. And we're trying to say the truth as it is. So Eliezer has his 10 camels and he's laden with all the 
valuables of Abraham and he travels to the city of Nahor. And he gets there, gets to the well, and he starts praying. And he says to God, help me, do kindness with me, do truth with me, help me because of Abraham. I'm here at the well and the girls are coming out and I don't know who to approach and I don't know what to do and how do I find the right candidate. I'm going to construct a test. And I'm going to ask for water and the right one is going to say, I'm not only going to give you water, I'm going to give your camel's water as well. So there's a few general points over here that we have to draw. Number one, Eliezer is doing something very logical. You don't know the essence of the person that you're going to meet or entertain settling down with. You have no idea. So how do you know if they're a good person or a bad person? How do you find out if they're the right fit for you? On what basis do you choose whether or not you're going to consider marrying this person? Well, you have to, you have to inspect. You have to investigate. You know, if we were doing a real vaccine or a, I guess a medicinal vaccine, you would want to do a double blind controlled study, placebos. Eliezer is trying to figure out if she is a candidate to marry Isaac. And specifically, he's looking for kindness. And the way you do it is by inspecting. He knows what he's looking for. He knows what is at the base of that pyramid. And he constructs a test to determine if this candidate fits the description. It sounds a lot like in, like a job interview. You have a picture of what you're looking for in mind, and you devise a test to determine if the candidate qualifies. It sounds very unromantic, but it made sense. You know, how else would you do this? Investigate this as you would rationally approach any other important subject. You know, trying to find a spouse at the bar or on the dance floor, it's again, like we said earlier, throwing darts at the board, trying to pitch stocks. And of course, Eliezer here is doing the inspection, but the principle is true for us. So that's one general idea that we find from this story. But if you examine it, it's really interesting. He doesn't ask the girl, would you mind giving me water and all my camel's water? He doesn't spell out what he actually wants. He says, give me water, and he wants the right girl to know on her own. Oh, his his camels also need some water. So when you're investigating, inspecting the prospective candidate that you are maybe considering to settle down with, you have to be aware of the fact that people's true character is often masked. It's hidden. And you know what? When you're on a day with them, they're going to be on their best behavior. So how do you actually find out? what they're really about. You have to play some 3D chess. You have to design some tests to try to see through the veneer. So he wants to see one thing, but he doesn't want to tell her about it. He's looking for a person's essence. And he's worried that maybe there's something that she's going to conceal. So he devises this test to find out. This is like the essence of statistics and you know, the, the problem with correlation doesn't equal causation. Any logical way to find something out, you have to make sure that the, the inputs are precisely tailored to ensure that you get the right result. It's very easy to get the wrong result and it, and it looks like it's the right result. Now, another point to take away is that he's looking for something very specific. He's inspecting to find out if she's a kind person. Does she notice what someone else needs without being told? Is she someone who's so self-centered, doesn't notice other people? Or is she someone who's so caring about other people, like Abraham was? So caring about other people that she's thinking about what does this person naturally need? Our sages tell us that this is the most important quality when it comes to finding a spouse. Does this person have sensitivity to others? Do they care for others? Do they have gentleness of character? Do they have concern for others? Do they have empathy? Or are they selfish? Are they narcissistic? Is it all about them? Oh, what is this guy bothering me? I don't want to give him any water. Go get water yourself or fetch water yourself. If you think about it, this is what marriage is all about. It's about a union of two different people. And therefore, if you have someone who is narcissistic, self-centered, 
they're going to be narcissistic and self-centered when it comes to their spouse as well. And therefore, the most imperative quality is to see others, to notice others, to care about them, to not be selfish, and to be able to meld and fuse with another person. So we have a whole bunch of ideas he has to investigate. He has to look for kindness. He's devising tests. But he's also praying. He's also getting God involved. Notwithstanding all his due diligence, he's relying on God. Perhaps we can even say that the sweet spot, the perfect blend of what we're supposed to do in looking for a spouse is due diligence plus prayer plus seeking divine assistance. The Midrash tells us that finding a spouse is as difficult as splitting the sea. One of the interpretations is that we know when Nachshon, the person who jumped in first into the sea, when he jumped in, the water didn't split. And he went in and reached his waist, it didn't split. It reached his chest, it didn't split. It reached his nostrils and couldn't go any further. He nafesh, the waters have reached my soul. And only then did it split. The way miracles work is that first you do all that you could do. You put in all your effort. You do all your due diligence and only then does God split the sea for you. Only then does the miracle happen. And th- those are the two parts here of what Eliezer is doing. Number one, he's praying, but he's not just relying on a miracle. He's doing the maximum of devising a test, of devising a test that makes a lot of sense, approaching it rationally. Does she have kindness? How do we find out? Well, what if, you know, what if, how do we discover what her actual character is about? Is she really self-centered? Because, you know, if someone asks you for a favor, even if you're not so kind, you, you know, maybe just respectful to do that. He wants to discover her essence. And the essence is all often hard to find. And that's what he's doing over here. Prayer plus due diligence. That is the two components of what Eliezer is trying to find out over here. And by the way, the Midrash tells us that at the very time that Eliezer was praying by the well, Isaac was praying simultaneously in Canaan. And the Talmud actually tells us, based upon this story, the Talmud tells us that determining who you're going to marry is from God. Not only that, the Talmud tells us, the book of Mokrat on page 18b, there is a principle that is featured in the Torah, in the prophets, in the writings, in all three parts of our Tanakh. It's a ubiquitous concept in Jewish literature. May Hashem ishal ish. It comes from God. A man to a woman comes from God. It comes from God. He's going to split the sea. You can anticipate a miracle, but you still have to do your due diligence. You do your match, and then you pray, and then you get God involved. And then you unlock the miracle. The Midrash tells us that the Almighty manipulates the whole world to bring two people together. Midrash even says, even the bastards, God works to set them up. There is an amusing story in the Midrash. It tells us of a great sage who was having a conversation with a Roman noblewoman. And she said to him, well, how long did it take God to create the world? says, well, six days plus one, Shabbos. Well, what is God doing since? What's he doing since? He's already finished creation. So the great rabbi responded while he's making matches. He's finding the guy, finding the girl, boy meets girl. He's making sure that those two meet. She says, well, you don't need God for that. I can do that myself. So she lines up. A thousand male servants on one side and then a thousand female servants on the other side. And she walks down the line and says, you're with you and you're with you and you're with you and you're with you and you're with you. She sets up a thousand matches. Huh, I don't need God. I could do it myself. And the next morning, the Midrash tells us, they all came back and they said, I don't like him. I don't like her. She's terrible. He's awful. And many of them had injuries. One of them is had a broken arm and one's a broken leg and... They're all suffering. They're all miserable. Ah, send me up with someone else. And the woman, the noble woman, walks back to the great rabbi and says, you know what? There is no God like your God. Indeed, you are correct. It's not something that we could do. But again, 
the structure here is you do your due diligence and that will unlock the divine miracle. And I think this is actually a very encouraging thing. In finding a spouse, you have God on your side. You have God fighting for you. In fact, the Talmud actually intimates that God goes to war for you. But of course, that's all contingent on prayer. You do your due diligence. You do your prayer. You make a pitch for divine assistance. And then God will go to bat for you. He will go to war on your behalf. And not only that, this is something that we can see. We believe, of course, that truthfully, everything is from God. But in this area, we can actually see the divine hand guiding the ship. You know, maybe one day I'll tell the story of how I met my wife. I have no doubt that the Almighty was pulling the strings. And that's not just my marriage, my parents' marriage, my grandparents' marriage. All of these stories are just way too improbable. How all the puzzle pieces from different worlds my wife is Canadian, so I guess we're, we're at least on the same continent. But different countries, how do we meet? It's a crazy story. My father grew up in Israel. My mother grew up in New York. How did they meet? An insane story. And my grandparents, my grandfather was from Germany. My grandmother was from Lithuania. And they met in Sweden of all places. And they got engaged in Israel. These stories are so improbable. But again, we get to see the mighty manipulating the pieces of the board, setting up situations and moving people and moving mountains to put people together. It's a very encouraging thing. Now, the verse continues by telling us that Rebecca was beautiful. So this is something that we have to acknowledge, even though it's important, you know, character and values and priorities, the bottom of this compatibility index. It tells us that she was attractive even though that wasn't part of what he mentioned in his qualifications. But the lesson here is that if there's no physical attractiveness or there's no attraction, if there's no chemistry, then there's no grounds for a relationship. Everyone knows that. It's not the only factor, but it's a necessary factor and that cannot be ignored. Now, there's an amazing thing in Rashi in verse 17. There were a lot of girls, the verse tells us, that we're all going to get water from the well. So how did Eliezer know which girl to approach to ask for water? Isn't that a good question? Lots of girls, lots of candidates. Who do you choose? So Rashi tells us that he ran to Rebecca for a very specific reason. He saw that a miracle was happening to her and the waters were coming up to her. She'd have to bend down to get the waters the water just ascended to her. He's like, wow, what's going on? This is a miracle. She must be the right one. He runs over to her and he asks for water and the rest of the story we already know. I want to speculate that Eliezer's prayer, part of the nature of the prayer, part of, part of the divine intervention is that there are a million candidates or maybe there were you know, 50 girls there and he knew because God told him which one of them to inspect. The answer to his prayer was the miracle of the water ascending to Rebecca because that showed Eliezer she's the one to approach. Of course, that's not to imply that God did only that, but that's part of the divine intervention, the divine aid, the divine guidance, the divine role. God going to war on your behalf, he will find a way to introduce you to your spouse or to your potential spouse. Again, you could drop the ball. It's not like we have no role to play. We have to do our due diligence and we have to know when to pull the trigger. Sometimes God delivers on a, on a silver platter the person who you're supposed to marry and because you just make a poor choice, because you don't seize the moment, because you don't pull the trigger, don't blame God for that. We have a role to play here too. But part of what God does is going to give us the opportunity to meet the right person for us. Now, the Midrash tells us that Rebecca didn't go to get water from the well every day. This was the first time in her entire life that Rebecca went out to get the water. Again, that's part of the miracle. The Almighty ensured 
that she will be there and he will know to approach her. But it's interesting, even though the water ascended to her, he still did the test. He still gave me the water and, and to see if she gave it to the camels as well. The miracle that happened with the water ascending to her, that does not trump the importance to do due diligence. The serendipity does not justify stupidity. Maybe it's a good bumper sticker. Serendipity does not justify stupidity. So Yezer asks her for water. She gives him water and she gives to his camels as well. And then he gives her, in verse 22, he gives her jewelry. Before he knows anything about her, before he knows that she is from Abraham's family, he is so convinced he gives her jewelry ahead of time. Now, there's an amazing Rashi here. Rashi points out that the jewelry is hinting at a lot of very advanced things that happened to the Jewish nation down the line. It's hinting at the collection of coins per capita. It's hinting at the two tablets. It's hinting at the Ten Commandments. It's kind of like an unbelievable Rashi. You know, Isaac, Rebecca, and I were married. Jacob's not born. We're a long way away from Sinai, from a nation happening here. It's it's very distant in the future. But the lesson here is, it's a very profound idea. We are now at the very nascent beginning of something that will eventually, hundreds of years later, result in a nation at the foot of the mountain, at Sinai, getting Torah, hearing the Ten Commandments, getting those two tablets, and there's something that's getting started now that's already beginning that process. I think this is trying to impress upon us the long-term thinking that's needed to make this work. Before the engagement, what's already being featured here is something that's going to happen only centuries down the line. This is the founding of something very, very big. And it's just, it's just two people. They're having this interaction with the camels, right? But already at this very early stage, the nation's being formed. And that's going to press upon us that, you know, all of our history, think about it, like we mentioned earlier, the person that you choose to live with, the person you choose to marry, that's your partner forever. And that long term, think so far down the line, is critical to help you make the right decision. You know, if you think about it, it's a little bit nerve wracking. You know, how do you know who to marry? How do you know who to pop the question to? Because again, we're thinking about what's happening hundreds of years down the line. If you make the wrong choice, if you pop the question to the wrong girl, it could corrupt you for centuries. It's going to mess things up. And I'm not a prophet. You're not a prophet. The joke that I always make is that I work for Torch. We're a non-profit organization. And a human can't possibly know what's going to happen in life. You don't know what's going to happen 10 years from now. You don't know what aspects of life are going to reveal maybe very bad or, or, or threatening or damaging or destructive characteristics in your spouse. How could a human possibly make a decision to say, this is the person I want to spend the rest of my life with. Not only that, the rest of my afterlife with. How do you know? Everything is at stake. Your entire future is at stake. Are you confident that you can make that decision? So the answer to this is very critical. This is an answer that could save lives. This is a very big part of the vaccine. And I heard this from maybe the most reputable source out there. We could solve this problem in one minute. We're told what to do. If you do what you need to do, you don't need to worry about God. If you are doing what's right, you're looking for what's right, you figure out what your compatibility index pyramid looks like. You know what you need. You know what's important to you. You've worked on developing yourself into a good candidate. You put your best foot forward. You've prayed. You've prayed your heart out. You've beseeched God to have 
him help you. You've done the test. You know what you're looking for and you found suitability and compatibility in the spouse and the potential and the candidate. You've done everything you could possibly do. Once you've reached that point, there's no responsibility on your shoulders. You don't need to know the future. You can't possibly know the future. You don't know. You're a fallible human. But God is infallible. And once you've done everything you can do and you've prayed to God, you've tried your heart out, the rest of the responsibility is not on your shoulders. It's on God's shoulders. You don't need to worry about that. You can possibly worry about that. You cannot possibly calculate that. But that is not your responsibility. Now, if you want to live with someone for a couple of years to inspect them. Let me live with them for a couple of years and then then we'll find out. I want to reveal to you the following statistic. Statistics show that the longer a couple stays together before they get married, not only does this not help, it actually detracts from their likelihood of having a good, happy, harmonious marriage together. So there's no way to have a guaranteed outcome. There's no way. You have to jump into the abyss. But when do you jump into the abyss? You jump into the abyss once you've done everything that you can do, once you've inspected everything that it is that you're looking for, if it's important to you. You know exactly. You've, you've done the time. You've spoken to the counselor. You've done the time to figure out. You've invested the time to figure out what it is that matters to you, what is the base of your pyramid. And you've met someone. And it's a person that you like. You're attracted to them. You have chemistry. You enjoy their company. And they actually, they seem to fit what you're looking for. And you've done your tests and you've you, you've inspected and you were aware. You know that they're trying to you know, present themselves in the best kind of light. But you see how, how they're treating this waiter, how they're treating the server, what happens when things go a little bit off, a little bit off kilter. You've seen them in many different situations. And they're pleasant and they're nice and they're kind and, and, and they're enjoyable and they seem to be a happy person and they seem to be a healthy person. You share your values with them and the priorities in life and what you want out of life and what they want out of life. It seems to match. You've done what you can. Now it's time to jump into the water and let God split the sea for you. You cannot wait. You have to jump in because it's not going to split unless you're in the water. Jump into the abyss and rely on God. He's going to catch you. You'll be in good shape. It's not going to help you to live together for five, six years. It's not going to help you. It just doesn't work. And the statistics back up what I'm telling you. So this is dose one. Come on, how painful was that? It wasn't so painful. This is dose one of the divorce vaccine. We want to make sure that the pandemic, the epidemic, doesn't affect you. And dose one is how to select the right spouse. We want to approach it logically. This is the most pivotal decision of your life. Why would you make the most important life decision in a totally illogical fashion? And we have a story that serves as this model. And we take away a lot of lessons to use the aid of an impartial third party Seek compatibility. Of course, it means a lot of different things. The more similar you are, the better. Understand the compatibility pyramid, what's important, what's a deal breaker, what's trivial. Try to construct tests and investigation to determine if the person fits the bill. Dating as inspection to determine if there are grounds for a relationship, not actually a relationship itself. Put your best foot forward. Make yourself as great a person and as desirable a candidate as possible, but do your due diligence and rely on God. Prayer. The Almighty hears everything you say. And by the way, prayer doesn't have to be in a shul. It does not have to be in Hebrew. It does not have to be ritualized. God is fully proficient in English and he is the ultimate matchmaker. Trust him. Let him take responsibility. It's not your concern. You do what you can and let him do his job. This concludes dose one. If you finished it, if you're listening to this, 
You now have one check on your vaccine card, but you're not fully inoculated. And again, I'm acknowledging it's painful. There's a needle jabbed into your shoulder, but the objective is to try to save you from much worse pain. Of course, we can't guarantee 100% efficacy. We're talking about 95487 percent of the time. And there are variants and there are going to be breakthrough cases and we still need another dose and maybe even a booster. But we, of course, have to wait a couple of weeks until the antibodies get activated. Until then, I'm wishing you the best. And with love from Houston, Texas, from the Torch Center, you take care. Have a fabulous day. I hope that you have a happy, harmonious, enriching life. And as always, my email address is rabbiwalby at gmail.com. I imagine that I'll get some vaccine emails. Just send me the emails. It's okay. I can handle criticism. It's not a problem. Send me an email, rabbiwalby at gmail.com.